Good morning. How's everybody feeling today? Oh, it's loud. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Clap it up, Jackson. There you go. All right. So, uh, thanks for getting up. Thanks for hanging out this morning. Um, I know it's every morning seems to feel a little bit earlier at the conference, but I'm um, glad glad to uh, hang out with you all this morning and hopefully give you some information, uh, maybe that you have thought about before, or maybe another angle of thinking about you know, making a record, putting out your first record, and uh, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, like Derek said, I am assistant professor of jazz trombone at the University of Texas, and uh, back in 2015, I decided to start a record label, and I never thought that I would start a record label, and I didn't know what that entailed, and um, I'll kind of get into that in a minute, but um, I have been doing this for since 2015, putting out records, uh, and mostly focused around my peer group uh, from New York. I moved to New York in 2010 uh, and went to Juilliard School. And then when I was at Juilliard, met a lot of great people. And then I saw a lot of people getting taken advantage of by uh, some people in the industry. You hear about all the different great artists who had their music um, stolen, for lack of a better, better word. Uh, by, by people in the industry who had, um, you know, more knowledge. And so I think it's really important for any musician any, at any age at any point in the process to have some kind of knowledge of, of some of the elements that go into re making a recording, releasing a recording, and owning their music and knowing what's possible and what's not possible. Because uh, things have certainly changed since, you know, Miles Davis was making records. So um, basically, I was thinking about this and. Um, Back, actually about 10 years ago from this month, January of 2012, I was entering my last semester at Juilliard doing my master's, and I was like, oh, what should I do? <laughs> what am I gonna do after school? And so the great idea I had was to make a record, right? Uh, why spend, why uh, live in a really expensive city and then go to get a master's program? Let's just add to that debt and just, you know, <laughs> let's just make a record. And so uh, that led to my first record, which is this record, and uh, it came out in uh, the following year, 2013. But I learned a lot of things. I got taken advantage of by a couple of people uh, in the industry, and I was like, man, this is crazy. And so I uh, decided after this record that I was gonna kind of, I would probably do something, but I never knew, I just kind of, uh, I came up with randomly, basically, with this the name of this label outside of music, and I um, was like, "Oh, it's my record label," and I put it up on CD Baby, and I didn't know what went into it. But then, um, after I made a record for another company, I realized I needed to start something and uh, help my friends and myself because they were always asking me, "What do I do with this? How do I do this? How do I do this?" And instead of explaining the same thing over and over and over, I decided, "Oh, I'll just I'll just do it for you. Just send it to me," you know. And so I went, that's how I got started. Uh, doing doing record label stuff uh, was for my record, and then uh, trying just to help my friend, basically. Maybe this is now it's your turn. Now maybe you're, now you're thinking about what to do uh, yourself. Maybe you're finishing school. Maybe you've been out. You're ready to get into the world, make your mark. Um, and so we're trying to think: uh, Are you ready to make a recording? You know, you have to be really, really not only thoughtful, but really, really particular about how you're going to connect with people and how you're going to tell your story and how you're going to start to uh, make your presence known in the music world. And that first recording is an important one, but it's really also not the end of the road. It's only the beginning of the road. And for me, that's a big theme that we'll kind of come back to throughout today, today's chat is thinking about the long game, not the short game. Uh, because, you know, you don't want to be a one-hit wonder. Not that those exist in jazz, really, but uh, you don't you don't have, like, one hit, you know, and then you just disappear forever. I think most of us want to make our life in this music, and that means we have a trajectory, and it goes like this, we hope, right? And uh, so you can't just think about one one recording. It's, it's lots of recordings. You think of your favorite artists, Miles Davis is a great example, you know, you hear, you go back and you listen to the transformation. So you have to ask yourself, are you ready to make a record? Probably not, but you'll never be ready. You'll, and if you never start, 
you'll always be scared of the first record. You know, so that's what I, when I was saying, I was in school, I was like, all right, I gotta make a record, because I gotta have something, you know, I have to have something. Uh, Curtis Fuller came to Juilliard when I was there, and a uh, hero of mine, obviously, is a trombone player, and, you know, we were hanging out in this hotel room, asking him questions, me and the other guys, and, you know, like, you know, Curtis, if you could go back and do anything again, you know, what would you do differently? And he said, I would record more of my own music because it lasts beyond your lifetime. And I was like, oh wow, that's pretty deep. And uh, so that kind of set me on a path like, all right, I'm gonna make recordings. And on that first recording, it was all, all my original music. And uh, that's what I focused on, you know. And so how, how are you gonna do that? Do you have to record original music? No, of course not. You can record whatever you connect with, whatever makes you happy, whatever brings you joy and is gonna connect with the people that you wanna connect with with your music. So to, in today's market, you have to think about these things. Like, who am I? How do I fit in to what's going on? Am I gonna kind of be like a, like a character? And like you think of someone who's a really big personality, like maybe like John Batiste, or maybe like Christian Scott, or maybe, you know, they have a, a very strong vibe when you think about who they are, what they represent, and what the music is that they're putting out. So is, how do you relate to that? You know, do you wanna be in a suit and tie? You know, do you wanna be more uh, casual looking? And how does that translate to the music? And so there's a lot of things that go into that. But th these are all the things that go into making a debut record that nobody t tells you about. You know, nobody's thinking about. Everybody's thinking about the music. And of course, the music is important. But there's all these other things that make it successful. And just getting started is huge. Thinking about what you're going to do and how you're going to be different than everybody else that's making their record, their debut record, right? Because everyone thinks, oh, this is my record, I'm going to tell you the one thing I get all the time as, as a record label uh, person that reads all the emails that come in. I'm sure you've heard this before. I'm uh, building on the tradition with one foot forward and one foot in the past. That's the time. Everyone says that. It's like, okay, so what else? <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing? Why should I care? That's the thing that I try to say. Like, why should anybody care? Of course, we're, we're in, a, in a place where we're talking about other jazz musicians, and jazz musicians, of course, care about jazz music, but how are you going to get outside of that? Our pie in the jazz world is pretty small, comparatively speaking, to other industries. So how, so how can you like, just add a few more people? You can go after the same people that everybody else is going after, or you can find the people that are interested in what you're doing. So we're going to talk a little bit here about some of the biggest misconceptions about putting out that debut recording, right? And so the number one thing that artists don't think about or don't know because they just haven't gone through the process yet, and I was a victim of this as well, the reason that I didn't uh, put out a record on another label and started my own was because of this number one, which is, I should put this project out as fast as I possibly can. I made it, and i got to get it out. Let's go, man. And uh, the timeline is probably the most important thing to think about, to make sure that you're getting the most out of your project. You're spending tons of money, you're, you're passionate about this project, and then you just throw it up on the internet as fast as possible, and nothing happens and people are surprised. And it's like, no, we're gonna go into a timeline in a little bit, but if you sent me an email right now, talk to me after this meeting, and you're like, I got a record, I wanna put it out, blah, blah. And I'll say, okay, cool. Well, we're looking at the fall of next year, well, 22, 22, uh, as the earliest time that we would put something out. If you came to me with a finished master recording, finished master, then we would say maybe the late summer or fall, because everyone works on really long timelines, and uh, you've heard of all these supply chain issues. We have not escaped. You know, vinyl is on like a six month turnaround. Uh, printing CDs, our printer just went from four to six weeks to 12 to 16 weeks to get your records back. So it's like, man, it takes a long time. So as you're thinking about your record, make sure you build in enough time. There's gonna be delays and you're not gonna know which part of the process is gonna be delayed until you're in it. And then you go, but my CD release gig is next week and I don't have CDs. That's not a good feeling and I've been there. Um, right, so the number one thing is make sure you have the timeline in mind. And so we'll go into a detailed timeline in a minute. Another thing that people think is that they're gonna make their record and they're gonna, I'm gonna shop it around and somebody's gonna give me a record deal. Well, I hate to tell you that uh, most labels don't work like that anymore. And even people that I know that are on the Blue Note 
Like they don't really pay like they used to. And um, when you get into an industry deal uh, where they give you a lot of money, the thing that no one thinks about is that it's a loan. It's a loan. And they're gonna charge you interest on the loan. You, they give you quote unquote in advance to make your record of 10 grand, but you're gonna pay them back 20. And are you gonna make 20 grand back on your record? Maybe you will, maybe you won't, I don't know. But that it's, it's a little more complicated than just like, I'm gonna get a record deal, people are gonna give, give me money. So the way we set up our record deal is to really try to enable artists to take control of their music. They retain 100% of their copyrights and publishing, and we don't touch any of those things because that's their intellectual property, and that's important to me. I don't want anyone stealing my tunes, so I'm not gonna steal any of their, anybody else's tunes. And um, so that was like the foundation of what I wanted to do with the record label, make sure that we were not taking anybody's copyrights and tunes uh, and trying to make the deal in their favor. So uh, we, we really, you know, make that a priority with outside of music. Uh, the next thing is I have to make a huge splash with the recording. You know, I talked about this before, but that's a huge problem. Everyone thinks that, oh, I'm gonna make this record and I gotta, you know, get out there. It's not how it works, man. <laughs> it's not how it works. Uh, you have to build slowly over time. And so getting back to being ready and not being ready you know, you gotta get something out so that you can build on it. You gotta make a, the, the purpose of that debut recording is to make a great first impression. And so I always recommend people to try to make as good of a first impression as you can on all of the people in the industry with that first release, but don't expect that it's gonna be like this huge thing. It's because it's just probably not. You know, if you think, I can't really think of anyone that only made one record and then made a huge splash in our industry. Everyone makes multiple records. Some do better than others, obviously, but uh, thinking about the long game. Again, I always say, live to fight another day. You know, Don't spend all your money on this first project, and then you have nothing left, or you get so discouraged. You know, So you have to think about the long game. And then the last, another classic thing that I hear all the time, people don't want to think about any of this stuff that I'm talking about today, uh, about the you know, all the things that go along with the recording, they say, my music will speak for itself. Well, I'm sorry, your music does not speak for itself. I have no idea uh, what you're doing with your music. You've got to tell me why I should care. So if you could think of anything, take away anything from this meeting as you're thinking about planning out your recording, why should anyone care? Why should they care? And answer the question. They should care because I am really passionate about X, Y, Z. I am making this music that brings people joy, whatever it is, I'm building on the tradition of the jazz messengers, you know, whatever you are passionate about, but it, the music does not speak for itself. You have to tell people, and you have to think about how you can spread that message, uh, especially when there's so much stuff coming out every single week, hundreds of tracks, hundreds. Um, and it's really interesting, you know, you think about, we think about jazz, and we think about the avenues that there are to get your music out there. The number one thing right now, obviously, is streaming. And the number one thing that everyone wants to get on are these Spotify playlists, right? But what's interesting about the Spotify playlists, if you go, the biggest one on Spotify is called State of Jazz. And if you go and you listen to State of Jazz, you might have to go like 12 tracks deep before you hear an acoustic recording. Uh, I was talking to a friend last night, and we were talking about like, what should I do to my my record? And like, they would be record. I'm like, man, you got to check out what, what's happening, so you know that if you make a record that sounds like the Jeff Hamilton Trio, which is killing, it's not going to fit on these on these um, present day state of jazz playlists. You, you, it's like electronic synthesizer groove based stuff, which is cool, and it has I mean, no judgment against that music at all. It's just the fact that. It, acoustic jazz music doesn't even fit into the jazz playlists anymore, uh, which is very interesting. There's other playlists where it is acoustic jazz music, but they might have not have quite as many followers. And even Kenny Garrett wasn't at the top of those, of those playlists. So it's a very interesting time uh, to release music. But, you know, I have other artists who are making, you know, maybe $1,000 a month in royalties who you might not have ever heard of, and they made a record of standards, and they're on, um, there's this kind of invisible um, part of Amazon music, where you, when you tell your Alexa, like, hey, play, you know, play jazz, play whatever, 
you know, there's a, like a radio station that comes on. And if you get onto one of those radio stations, nobody will ever know that it's you, but you can get some royalties from that and you can make some money. So when you're getting back to thinking about like, what am I doing with this recording? What is it for? What is the type of music that I want to release because I have these goals? You know, you have to think about how that, how that relates. And so we had another artist that released an amazing piano quartet record back in October. And he's like, I want to do a playlist promotion strategy and talk about getting on these Spotify playlists. I said, well, what's the goal here? You want to get on like these uh, curated editorial playlists where you're going to, you know, be alongside these other records. And I was just talking about where your record signing is going to really fit because it's a killing acoustic quartet record, but you're amongst all this electronic stuff. Or do you want to make money off of this? And he's like, well, I guess the second one. I said, okay, well, then let's use the most boring track and promote that one. And it'll be on all of the like coffee table jazz and like all of this stuff. So you got to think about creative ways to enable you to make the most out of your art by saying, I'm also going to make a standards record and that's going to get on these playlists. It'll give me a little money to do the next project. So, you know, having someone you can talk to, a, a label, that's kind of what we do. So we say, okay, here's your record. This is, these are the possibilities that we can take your music. Like your original music is great. And we want it to get on those playlists, but if we take the ballad and try to promote the ballad, you could actually probably get further, more and more stuff out of it. So um, there's a lot of, kind of a lot there to think about, but um, hopefully that's uh, somewhat helpful. And as we go through today, feel free if there's any questions, feel free to raise your hand and we'll kind of diverge and then I'll try to bring us back to reality here. But um, okay, let's keep moving here. So, what do you guys think? What's the point of making your first record? We kind of touched on it a little bit. What do you? What does everybody think? What's the point of making your first record? Expression. I'm going to make art. Yes, that's great. That's a great reason to make a record. What else? A calling card. A calling card. Everyone says that too. Business card. I need a business card. A calling card. And that's true. What else? Get some gigs. Yeah, you can't get any gigs without a recording, right? Develop, develop name recognition. Yeah, like I said, make a good first impression. I think the number one thing, all of those things are true, but the number one thing that you're trying to do is to build your audience. And so the audience is a lot of different people. And so when I say, like, what are you, who are you trying to reach? Or what's the point? Or why should anyone care? This is all different for different people. Um, the jazz radio people are looking for one thing. Downbeat Magazine is looking for another thing. Uh, I, as the label owner, am looking for something else. Uh, the people that love Art Blakey are looking for one thing. People that love Jacob Collier are looking for another thing. People that love Snarky Puppy, that's a different thing too. So you're thinking about the debut recording is to start building your audience because if you have a strong audience, you can basically do whatever you want. And sometimes we have it backwards, I think, in the jazz world that we want to kind of come at because because of the because we come through like a lot of education and we're professionals when we get out we think you know this should happen you know give me give me the money give me the money give me the gigs right but it's like well you need an audience if you have an audience you don't have to wait for the club owner to give you the gig you can say man i'm going to bring 500 people to this gig and they're going to pay me ten dollars and then we're going to make five thousand dollars like it's very easy math but we sometimes we don't want to think about it that way because we want the risk because we put the, in so much time we want to put the risk on the venue and we have to be a part of that conversation i think you know we have to think about building that audience slowly like i said through making multiple records aiming at different parts of the industry industry different parts of the audience um, I'll tell you, you know, last year, last year, 2020, I put out a record that uh, was called Cast of Characters, and it was the record that I was most proud of compositionally and all of this kind of stuff. Like musically, I was pretty into it. I was like, man, this was good music, and I usually hate my music, so um, I was really proud of it. And it, when it came out, and of course, that's the one that did the worst, right? And the, the record that I did the fastest, with almost no thought at all, has been the one that has performed the best. And so sometimes we don't know from the outside 
how to assess like which thing is the the most not important thing that's going to be the most uh, accessible thing for the audience because this was like a through composed a bunch of tunes that were long they had different you know time changes and all this stuff as cool as a musician but the radio hated it we didn't want to play any of that so another record that was a standards record they, they wanted to play it and it's got lots of lots of um, radio play so it's something to think about um, in terms of doing this. If you want to learn more about building an audience, I would highly recommend a, um, there's an article by a great tech writer named Kevin Kelly, and the, the article, article is called 1,000 True Fans. And uh, a lot of people talk about this, uh, but I would just recommend you go and read that. And it's just about building one fan at a time. Yes? If, like, say your group or whatever it has to cater to different subsets of the audience, like, mm -hmm. do you want to do that? Do you suggest, you know, two different recorders to do that, or do you try to get each of those audiences to the same recording? Um, I've done both. People have done both. I think um, in a de debut recording, I think doing both is probably the best thing, but usually what happens in our case is that we get the record after that it's finished, the artist has made it, and we didn't get to have this conversation first, you know? Um, I think ultimately you still have to make the record that you want to make, right? So regardless of what I'm telling you about the marketing side or like picking this or getting on a playlist, ultimately you still have to resonate with whatever it is. So that means not recording particular music or just doing your vision, that's cool. But just knowing the expectation of like, okay, well these people aren't gonna like it. Like, so I know, like, oh, if I put my original 12 minute tracks out here, the radio is going to be like, X. Just know that. And I'm like, I'm cool. That's fine. You know? um, but sometimes I want to include standards because I want to get in this thing or do ballads. Or I thought about, man, I should just do a ballads with strings record so that I can just get on all these like playlists. And nobody knows who I am, but I can like make a little bit of money. You know? so, you can do it both ways to answer your question directly, but I find for myself a little easier to kind of segment like, all right, this project is for this and it reaches these people. Now this project is for these people. Like uh, this project's for my trombone nerd friends. And then uh, this one's for the jazz audience. And this one's maybe, you know, I had a fusion band in, high, in college. So like we did that and, uh, for some other people. So I kind of segment it off, um, but you can do it both ways. All right, so some important elements to consider when you're doing this. Uh, planning for your record. What's the concept? I said, like I said before, the music does not speak for itself. What's the concept? Is it an Art Blakey tribute record? Is it uh, a trombone ensemble record? Is it a brass record? Whatever it is, what's the concept? Uh, is it have a, like a macro socio-political angle? Does it have, um, you know, is it about something? Does it have a narrative? Uh, so thinking about that, what's the concept? What's the story? You know, what do, what does someone get out of it? How do they know why you made this? Why should they care? That's the same thing. What's the concept? Why should they care? Now, who's in the band? Now, a lot of times, people do two things usually. One is they hire their friends for free to make the record, and that's fair. I did the same thing. Uh, pay them whatever you can afford. Um, but as you move through the process. Uh, but the other thing that people do is the opposite end of the spe spectrum of that. And they say, I need to hire Ron Carter and Jack DeJanet and be on my trio record. And they spend 25 grand getting those guys on the record. And then it may or may not pay enough. I mean, it's great. I wish I could hire them too. But um, thinking a little bit more about like, okay, who can I hire in my band? And what are they going to do for the project musically, of course, but also after the music? Like, what are they going to bring to the table? Do they know somebody that can connect me to a record label? Do they know somebody that can help me get a gig? You know, do they, can they teach me that? Can they represent what I think? If you're making a record about um, a certain a certain artist, right? Like, okay, I keep saying Art Blakey, but it's an obvious example. Can you hire somebody to play with Art Blakey? You might be able to. There's a lot of those guys that are still floating around. Um, and they can help you to develop what your concept and your story. You can get that connection, the deeper connection to the ideas behind your recording. So thinking about a little more deeply 
other than those two things. I tried to find somewhere in the middle, not hiring the most expensive people and not only hiring my friends that will do it for cheap. Somewhere in the middle where you're being thoughtful about how it re is represented, your music and also the stuff outside of music, uh, on the promotion side. Okay, and then, then we have our budget. Um, unfortunately, I didn't believe my teacher. I went to Eastman for my undergrad. Clay Jenkins, a great trumpet player, we were in combo class. I don't know how it came up talking about records. And he was like, yeah, it yeah, cost like, maybe like $10,000 to make a recording. And I was like, no way, that doesn't cost $10,000. I could do it for cheaper. And then I made my first record and how much money did I spend? $10,000. <laughs> um, so it does cost a lot of money, right? And if you can save yourself um, on various items along the way, of course, but it's gonna cost probably $10,000. By the time you, if you do a full-fledged release with the full team that we're gonna kind of get to in a second, um, it's gonna cost you some money. And it, you know, the way that I think about it is that if you start a business, uh, you have a lot of startup costs, right? If you open a restaurant, you gotta find a space, you gotta find people, you gotta renovate, you gotta blah, 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 food, etc. Hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe to get that, that business going. And when we're making a recording and investing in ourselves, that's the start of us making a business out of our music. At least that's how I look at it. And so the $10,000 that you spend is pretty cheap compared to starting a restaurant, you know? And it's gonna come right back to you, and it brings you joy, and it's a document of what you were working on at a certain time. So I know it sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. However, if you are, <coughs> you know, organized, thoughtful. You don't have to spend it all at once. You can save up a little bit at a time. Um, it's gonna cost you, you know, 10 to 15,000, sorry, inflation, uh, now to kind of, kind of get a record out. So who are these people that we're paying $10,000 to? Well, of course, you know, I put label here, publicity, radio, these are all things that can affect the budget. Um, the label, you know, I said the deals don't work the same way now. You're gonna bring most labels now a finished master recording, uh, and they're not gonna license it from you. They're gonna basically have a distribution agreement, which is what we have. It's, a, it's an agreement where we agree to help you get it out there, right? And for a small, in our case, it's not that big of a percentage, but some people take a lot of money, a lot of percentage, and that's something you have to kind of research. But uh, so do you have a label? Do you need a label? Why would you need a label anyway? You know, I, at this point, you know, it's super easy to throw things up on the internet, but do you have someone like me or another experienced person that's put out records that can help tell you which tracks to pick, to pitch to Spotify? You're like, okay, pick that one. That's the one, pick this one. You know, do you want to have a team to help you, basically? That's what a label's gonna do. Um, and that's like the value, I think, that we provide is having someone to ask questions to that kind of knows what's up. And in our case, being musicians, you know, we are the guys that are on the team are all musicians and uh, care about the music first. So, uh, and then the more questions from there is like, okay, do I use a publicist? The publicist is probably the most important person on your team. That person is gonna be the conduit of your music getting to the people. Now, this person is not a magician. This person is not a wizard. They cannot just invent things out of thin air. You have to have a concept. You have to. If they don't have a story, they cannot sell your story to anyone. Downbeat also will tell you, go over to the thing and see, does, any, does anyone send in the music saying, I have one foot to the future and one foot in the past? And they'll say, yeah, every single person says that too. Right? So you have to have something else, some kind of story, and that publicist person is gonna be the conduit. There's lots of great ones. And, but what I recommend is spending as much as you can on this person, but not spending all of your money on this person, right? So these type of people, publicists, you can expect somewhere around $1,000 a month to, to pay for somebody to do this. Um, that's really good. You can find cheaper people, you can find more expensive people. Um, you have to find somebody that wants to invest in you. The hardest person for the publicist to work is the first record person, the debut record person. And making it easy for them by having a strong concept, maybe by having some names that relate to the concept, uh, name musicians, I mean, that are related to the idea. 
uh, are very helpful in getting your foot in the door. Uh, so with this publicist, you know, be careful. This is the person where I had a bad experience. I'm not gonna name names while we're talking here, but um, the person I hired told me he could do everything. Oh, I'll take care of everything, blah, blah, blah. Pay me this amount of money and I'll just handle all the press and all the radio and everything. I was like, oh, this sounds great. But you, the reason I have it listed here separately is because when you think about this, there's hundreds of people that they're gonna contact. If you just think all the all of the radio radio stations, if you think about all of the newspapers, think about all of the jazz outlets, that's a lot of people. It, does that person actually have enough time to chase down all the records that they just sent out? A radio person is going to send out maybe 250 CDs. Does the person that's chasing down downbeat and jazz times also have time to chase down 300 recordings? Well, I'll tell you, no. So if you find someone that says they're going to do both, you should be very uh, wary. You should ask, well, how are you going to do that? Is this like an abbreviated campaign? Is this your full campaign? Uh, because people specialize in these areas, publicists, jazz radio. Um, so that's the team. You need your label to get the music from your studio to the street. You need the publicist to help tell your story. And then the radio, obviously, for the radio. But um, some people ask questions about the radio. Like, why are you doing radio? Radio is, does anyone listen to the radio? Um, and I contend that even if the numbers are going down of people that listen to jazz radio, if you think about the people who are most involved in a scene uh, anywhere, it's often uh, people that work in the radio station. Um, they control whose gigs get on the, on the air, right? So if you don't invest in radio, um, there's a good chance that when you go to that town, they might, they, they haven't seen your record come in from that conduit. Remember I was saying for a publicist, they haven't, that's the person introducing your music. It's the same with radio. They're introducing your music to their audience. And if you get it, from, if they get it from a trusted source, they're gonna be more likely to take a look at it than if you get it from you know, me putting it in an envelope and sending it directly to myself. So uh, I think that you're reaching the tastemakers in all the markets. That's what I think about radio. Even if it's not getting that much radio play, your name is getting in front of the DJs who also talk to the people that book the festivals in those towns, that book the venues. Like, you know, you want those DJs on your side, I think. If you want to build a career like we're talking about, you want all these people. So uh, there's other people you can have on your team. Most of us, uh, for a first record, probably don't have a manager, probably don't uh, have anything additional. But when you're thinking about it, do I need a label? Do I want publicity? And do I want radio? And I would say you should do it, like I said, like the best, the best you can, the most money you can spend that's comfortable, that, because no matter what, if you don't do it the first time, then the next time's the first time. If it's your fifth recording and you've never hired a publicist, that's your first record, all over again, you know? And so that's, that's kind of why I want people to know, like, you've got a plan, you got to have a little bit of money saved up so you don't have to go back to square one five years in or five records in and you've never, you know, established your presence on the, on the kind of scene, you know. The scene meaning, you know, the, the um, industry scene. So that's why I said, live the fight another day, don't spend all your money on your first project. All right, so let's talk about the timeline here. Let's, a little more detail. So let's work backwards from someone sending me something. Well, it was when I made this PowerPoint, so a couple of weeks ago. But if we said, okay, we have a finished master recording, we're gonna shoot for August 12th, like I said, the end of summer or beginning of fall. <clears throat> so you gotta back up, we always back up from here. So now with the streaming services, we always wanna make sure that we're getting things set up correctly. Uh, if you don't have Spotify for artists, Apple Music for artists, Amazon for artists, uh, you should get those set up. You can't get them set up if you don't have any music out. So then, like, well, what do I do? So what we do is we always make sure to put out a single four to six weeks before the album comes out to make sure that um, you are getting all those profiles set up and they're correct. You'd be surprised how many people have your name in the world. Um, I'm surprised how many artists like get mapped onto the wrong person. Um, so we just try to get those sorted out. And so that's another value of having a team 
like a label that can fix things, because cbbaby.com is wonderful, but they can't help you fix these things. It takes a long time. So having a person you can call sometimes is nice. That's kind of what order we come in. Um, so a distributor, <coughs> excuse me, wants ours at least, wants a uh, physical product in their store, in their warehouse rather, 12 to 16 weeks back. So if you go back again, so we're back, we're to May here. And so if you want them there by May, like I said, I wrote four to six weeks. Well, it's more like six plus weeks to get the things printed. So now you're looking at early April. All right, so to go to print, what do you need? Well, you need to finish art artwork. Okay, well, I need to hire an artist and we gotta go back and forth. We gotta talk about the concept and we gotta make sure that we get you know, the catalog number and the websites and uh, everyone's bio and write about the record and, and make sure that I put the track timings on the back cover because the radio person needs to be able to know how long the track is to play it on the radio. So if I hide it inside the booklet, they're never gonna know. Uh, so making sure all that stuff is together. So maybe a month for that and then back up again because you gotta get photos taken. You gotta think about what that is. Well, then, okay, so before that, you gotta figure out if you're gonna have a label, and they gotta tell you about the release date, and they gotta tell you um, that you can't release until August because you have to do all this stuff in this January, right? So here we are, January. So that's what we're saying. Uh, you gotta have time here, you know? And so I, I mentioned the distribution needs 12 to 16 weeks, but so does Downbeat, so do all the magazines. So your publicist needs three to four months ahead of the street date to get your stuff out. So this is why instantly when somebody says, I wanna get this out next month, I said, no, <laughs> that's not a good idea. Uh, you can't do it. Sorry, you can do it. I don't recommend doing it because you're not taking full advantage. You're throwing money, so much of your hard earned money at this project, you wanna make sure that you're getting the most, the most out of it. So that's a really uh, quick, you know, a quick, um, aside about, about the timeline. Another thing people like to ask about, uh, and I think is a good conversation to have, is do we need to still print CDs? Because I don't know about you, but I don't have a CD player. I have a boxes of records of my own and I have no CD player. Um, so should we print CDs? Um, well, I think you, at this moment, you still have to, if you wanna play the game. The game, meaning building up your career through the music industry. Uh, there are certain people that will not look at your stuff if you don't have a physical product. And some people look at it as a barrier to entry. Some radio stations literally don't have the mechanism to play streamed music or digital files. They have to put it into the CD thing and press the button and they, they're analog, right? They want that. Um, so having that little disc to remind somebody that you exist, that can be really important. And so even though most people don't have CD players, at this point it's still important to have them, uh, like somebody said, as a calling card, it gives people something to have a, a great set of coasters in your house. Uh, but no, uh, seriously, you do have to have CDs to uh, give to these people, especially the radio people. Uh, and it's kind of like a barrier to entry thing, you know? It's like, if you're serious about your music, you're gonna print CDs. All right, now let's, while I'm talking about that, this is not on the slide, but it just occurred to me that I should mention something about this, which is vinyl. Everyone says, man, my uncle really loves vinyl, and he really wants me to print vinyl. And it's like, okay, cool. Well, vinyl, like I said before, is on a very long delay to print. It's gonna take at least six months to print your vinyl. Um, it's only 22 minutes a side. Most people's records are almost an hour. So are you gonna print a double LP? That's so expensive, so expensive. I mean, you're talking like to print 200 vinyls is gonna cost you like $2,500, $3,000. And your uncle's gonna buy one. You know, I'm like, and I think sometimes we think everyone's asking for vinyl because three people emailed you and your uncle. So you sold five maybe. And you've got all these vinyls and you've invested so much money. So I, I usually steer people away from it. Unless you've pre-sold like a hundred vinyl and you know you're gonna sell them, it's really a difficult thing. Because uh, lots of people tell you they want something before you ask them for the money. <laughs> you know? They're like, oh, we want the vinyl. But then once you've spent that money, you're like, oh, I need to charge $40 for this vinyl. 
nobody wants to buy it. <laughs> so just things to keep in mind. I'm nothing against it. If you want to do it, you should do it. Like I said, when our artists come to us, we want to realize their project the way they want to realize it, and we don't want to tell them, unless it's a really bad idea, we don't want to tell them no. You know. So uh, that's just a, a little aside about Uh Okay. We talked about this. I can get it up next week. But don't do it. You know, and we talked about this before. So, what, you know, why should anybody care? And I'm going to bring circles back to this point because that's the thing. Why should anyone care? What's the story? You know, it's your debut recording. I get it. You want to share all of the breadth of what you can do. You want to share all of the great things you've been working on, all your great music. But you got to think a little bit more. Like, what else? This is my first album. It represents me as an artist. And think about that. Why should anybody care? Something you can do that's pretty useful is to do some research, like I was talking about before, about the Spotify playlist. What's getting played? But think about also uh, peers, colleagues, heroes. What do their records look like? What do they sound like? You know, how, how, what does the package look like? What does the package feel like? What kind of paper is it on? I know that sounds pretty boring, but like certain, but certain printers feel really cheap when you've touched the paper. You don't want to feel cheap, I don't think. You know? So how does it look? Did they hire a graphic designer or did somebody open up you know, their uncle's computer, Microsoft Paint, and draw? Man, I'll tell you, some people think they can do their artwork. They can't do their artwork. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's important to invest a little bit of money. And there's a lot of creative ways to find people. Fiverr.com is a great resource to a two R's, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. You can find some graphic designers there. Um, and then what do the projects sound like? like what, actually, what kind of music is getting put out? You can see different labels are putting out different types of things. If you listen to something from Pi Recordings, you're gonna hear a lot different of something than from High Note or from Sunnyside or from uh, Positone. Look at, look at what the record labels are, what they're putting out. What do the projects sound like? What are the concepts, you know? Does my music fit in any of these buckets? Should I go this way or that way, you know? Look at your heroes, look at your friends, look at your colleagues, look at your professors. What are they doing? Where is it going? You know, what's the story? If you can't, you know, you can kind of track. Like, if there's, not, if there's a good story with a record, it tends to get a lot of press, and you'll see it in a lot of places. If there's maybe not a good story, or there isn't a story, you'll notice that maybe that record didn't get as much attention. You can kind of go back. Now that you have the internet, you can look through all the archives and downbeat, you can look through and see, did they get reviewed? How many stars did it get, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is a question, you know, who is it for? Yeah. What, which part of your audience, you know? Where is it gonna go? Is it for the trombone nerds? Or is it for the jazz audience? Or is it for the fusion audience? You know, who is it for? So do some research and think about it. You know, I think a great example of someone who's navigated this, he's had assistance, I think, but and kind of moved along a spectrum is a guy I went to school with at Juilliard, his name is John Batiste, and he's on that um, Colbert show, you know him, but like he just put out some music that's like moved from jazz oriented playing with Roy Hargrove and Wynn Marcellus, you know, like he was doing that, and now he's got this other thing where it's very, like the imaging of what he's doing in the, in the, the music videos are like classic Motown, kind of vibes, but with that twist of his personality and everything. So it's like, what does that look like? You know, like, what is that? And how do you create that for yourself? Not on maybe that scale, but like, how do you do that for yourself? What what do you look like? How are you presenting yourself? And uh, what kind of artwork do you have and all that, that stuff? Because that's the first impression. You saw that record that I, the, the first cover of the first record, it was like classic uh, jazz cover. Okay, uh, and so, um, you want to think, is that the vibe I want to put out? I changed after that first one to maybe do something else. Um, okay, so I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. So as you're thinking about your concept, you want to think about these two things. What I want to make, you know, the craziest, awesomest music, and then who I want to reach. And you want to, I always say you want to aim to the, the middle somewhere on the record. Not the whole record, you want to challenge people to listen to the music you want to create, of course. Uh, you, want to you want to make what makes you happy and joyful and you feel like it's killing. I think that's important when you're making a record, but you gotta have something in the sweet spot here. Um, so for me, that might mean including 
uh, Duke Ellington's music on the record because that's important <laughs> to me and I think people relate to it, so I do that, you know. Um, or you might do standards, like I did a record. I played yesterday, uh, Maria from West Side Story. I, I put that in this category of like, it's something that people know, but I put my own twist on it and I'm happy to play it. And it fits in this. We're in Texas, so I had to put a star. You know? <laughs> Uh, okay, we talked about jazz radio. Uh, a touring strategy, you know, um, we could go into a long conversation, but part of the things you should plan as you're developing your first record uh, is thinking about the long game again and starting to build a touring strategy from day one. So my first record, I only had two gigs for the tour. There was one gig in New York and one gig in my hometown, which is Rochester, New York. And so I played two gigs. And then the next record, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to Rochester, and then I went to Cleveland, and my parents moved to Phoenix, Arizona, so I did a gig out there, and so now I had four gigs. And then the next tour, I did 10 gigs. And then the next tour was 15. And uh, the tour for a cast of characters was supposed to be really big, but then we had, we had COVID, so that didn't happen. But you know, you're still building over time, and I always invest in a touring strategy, and I don't necessarily make a lot of money on those record tours, but I want the music to get out. I want to go meet those DJs that we were talking to. And so I just budget that into the project from the beginning. How much can I spend on the tour? So there's a lot of different ways to do this. You don't have, you can stick your, you can stick your band in a van and drive them around. Or another strategy I've used is finding the best musicians I can in those places. That's what people used to do, you know? People, Benny Golson would go to Chicago and play with the rhythm section in Chicago, and he'd go to LA and play the rhythm section there. And so I kind of took that strategy and took my music <coughs> uh, around. And uh, obviously we want to take our band, but sometimes it's not possible. So think about a touring strategy. You know, the other part of that is sometimes people get hung up about the release date and the tour, the CD release. It's gotta be on the same day. No, it does not. Your tour can be any time during the year. Look at um, like any pop group. They tour the record, the project for months. It's the such and such tour. And it's like in Europe this month and then US this month. It, you can tour all year. I tour my record from the time that record comes out until the cycle is over. So at least six months. So don't worry too much about making sure you have the dates all lined up. So um, this is my little, Thing that I talk about, you know, you want to create, connect, and then do it again. So when we talk about records, um, it's making making records, hiring the team to get it out to the people, and you have to do it a lot of times. You know, it's not one record. Like I said, it's this longitudinal kind of idea. Um, so if you want to work with uh, me and this, our team, you know, feel free to get in touch. Um, like I said, what we do is very artist focused, and we have a label called Next Level. That's uh, you could send us some stuff if you want to, you know, check out this the link. But um, it's only for early career artists and people that are releasing maybe not their first record, but uh, early in their career. It could be first, second, third. Maybe they maybe they're that person that has three or four records out there, but they never hired a team. You know, so it's kind of like their first record. Uh, so that's something that we, we kind of do uh, special. And then uh, I'm working on a book with the same name. And uh, it was supposed to come out this month, but it's not done yet. I have a physical proof if anyone wants to check it out. But um, it's talking about all these kind of things, using social media to build your following and build your audience. You know, that's that's the whole thing: is building the audience. We're kind of coming full circle here, back to what we started with. And um, we're also launching a program uh, to help early career artists figure out um, what to do with themselves so, and how to monetize their art. Uh, that's called the Outside Incubator, and we're launching this in May of 2022. Uh, first cohort of artists, and so the applications are open for people that want to get involved with that. So uh, all those things are all those things are on our website. But um, more importantly than any of this stuff um, is if there's any questions in our last well, it's 9:50 now. But if there are any questions I can answer, I'm happy to continue the conversation in the lobby after this. Yeah. I do. Are there two that come to the top of your mind in both fields? Uh, two in both fields? Okay. My favorite publicist for myself 
Her name is Anne Braithwaite. Uh, that's who I use. And another, another one my label uses a lot, her name is Lydia Liebman, Dave Liebman's daughter. Uh, and then on the radio side, Groove Marketing with no E, it's a G-R-O-V. Uh, and a guy named Neil Sapper, his company is called New World Jazz Marketing. Uh, that's two of each one. Yeah. Yes, I set my phone up there, so. It'll be on my YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, <laughs> smash the bell. Um, yeah. uh, yes. Have you heard anything about jazz musicians having success yet with NFTs? Um, I've been thinking about it a lot. I haven't seen any jazz projects yet. Um, I think the, I think, where I think the opportunity is is in building in the like composer royalties, the royalties into the NFT smart contract where like it'll automatically, you know, get paid. And if somebody sells it, you know, getting that residual royalty. I think there's something there, but I don't code computer stuff. So I need to uh, get somebody to do that. But I have not seen any projects yet. And if you don't know what NFTs are, you can look that up on the internet. Uh, the benefits of self-publishing is that you're totally in 100% control of everything. Um, you can do it faster. Like I said, the label's going to say, no, slow down, we need time. And if you want to do it yourself, you know, you can. So I think there's a, I have personally, I use the strategy to do both. I do some things really fast and put it up on YouTube, and then I do some things slow, like make records. So I think you have to do both, you know. Um, put stuff on, up on Spotify, Instagram, YouTube, it's a different audience. You know, the people on Spotify are not the same people that follow you on Instagram. There could be crossover, of course, but um, building your audience in all the different places. Uh, so yes, yes, do it. Um, but making records is an important part of like establishing yourself to the industry if you want to make a career playing this music, you know? Uh, so I just say, you want to play the game, you got to play the game. And if you don't want to, that's fine, but just know that this is how it works. You know, for now, it could change. It's going to change again, I'm sure. Yeah. Would you, uh, the self-publishing thing? Would you recommend um, doing that for a period of time as kind of like, uh, a way to grow and kind of understand what sounds you're going for, or who you are, how you brand yourself? You know. Uh, sure. Uh, or do you more so recommend just talking to the publishing thing and uh, really getting some people behind you? Um, um I think. You don't, you don't need to jump straight to making a record, if that's what you're asking. I think you can make music and release it online first and build up a following. Yeah, that you should do that. Build up a following until you get to a, a point where you feel like, okay, I need to have all the things we talked about. You know, focus on building the audience, and then you won't have any problems selling the records if you have the audience already. You know, But um, the reason this talk was branded the way it was is because in school, sometimes you think about, okay, I graduated from school, the next thing I need to do is make a record. You know, and so it's like, okay, yes, you can make a record, do these things, but if you can build your audience beforehand, then you're gonna have a lot easier time, you know, when you make the record. Now you don't have to kind of hustle as much. Um, okay, yeah, one more, and then I'll go in the lobby, we can talk more after, yeah. Yeah, so most publicists will work it for about three months after release date, if it's going well. So if it's not, it might be two months, but, but they start working you know, months ahead of time, right? So most campaigns are three or four months long. Radio is the same, three or four months. Um, and that's kind of the length, that's kind of it. That's kind of the length of the cycle. It's kind of like six months. You do a single, a month, uh, six weeks, four, six weeks, a month before, and then the three months after. So it's about five-ish months. Um, and if you're, you can stretch it a little longer, six months, and then you want to wait at least another six months before you do another one. So that's kind of the cycle. Is, that's helpful. Well, thank you all so much for getting up with me this morning. I appreciate you all, and uh, happy to connect uh, after this. Thank you. Thanks again.